I'm getting the Word of God, and just the Monday rolls around. I'm like, oh man, I wish it was Sunday already. And uh, so just excited to be here. Today we finish our series on the book of Psalms. And uh, it's been a little bit of a ride through this, uh, this story of Psalms. It's been a lot, I've gotten a lot more out of it than I thought I would get out of it, to be honest. I was actually really scared about getting into Psalms. And um, because it, it can be a little bit convoluted sometimes. I'm not really sure what's going on all the time. But it's just been so wonderful. And we started off with this idea in Psalm 14 where we saw that we are really a bunch of sinners that need a savior, that we are just these really wretched people that have no hope. And the psalm ends with saying, perhaps there's a savior that will come out of Judea, out of Judah. And obviously that becomes Jesus. We looked at Psalm uh, chapter 16 where that savior is coming and he loves us so much. He just says we are his delight, that all the saints are his, one of his greatest delights. So even though we're sinners, we are loved infinitely by this savior. We saw in Psalms so chapter 21, 22, 23, that idea where even though sometimes we have the hard times, that God is looking to bring us to experience peace in the pain, that God's power and his presence brings peace in the pain. And, uh, uh-oh, this was on. You're getting a sneak peek. Oh, spoilers. Um, and so, but with this idea of, okay, we have this amazing Savior. We got this amazing, powerful God. He's doing this incredible work. There's times in my life where I still experience something else. And obviously you've seen it on the screen, so this whole intro is going to be like this, da-da, but oh well, there you go. That's what you get for spoilers. Is, are you clicking this? Or is it someone else? I don't know what's going on. It's got it a mind of its own. Don't move. Okay, we're just going to pray, and then we'll uh, get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we just invite your presence here, Lord. We love you everywhere, and where you say two or three or more gathered, we are... Uh, we're excited for what you're going to be doing here in your word, Lord. And we just pray that uh, you be here, that you work. Lord, I pray for all the souls that are here, Lord, that we just desperately need more of you in our lives. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that today we'll just be able to learn and unpack more about what you're doing in us um, and because of who you are and what you've done. And pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I experienced times where Okay, God is this great God. I know he loves me. I lo- know he's awesome. I know he's working a plan. But I still have days where I wake up and I'm just sad. And it, my mind says, it shouldn't make, you shouldn't be here, Kevin. Like, wh- why are you sad? Like, you have this eternal hope. You got, for eternity, you're going to be in paradise. Talk about a retirement plan. I mean, I've got it made. Well, sometimes Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday rolls around. I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm just sad or I'm depressed or distressed, my soul is in anguish. And the psalmist starts off that way in Psalm 42. He says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. Well, that doesn't sound very sad. Yet. And it's because his mind knows where he should be. His mind says, yes, I know that God is the most infinite joy that I could possibly have. He's, he'll make me more content. He'll meet all my needs, all my values. That's where hope and salvation is. For the future, for now, for redeeming my past, it's all there. I know my soul wants to be there, God. My mind wants to be there. But my heart sometimes says, I don't know, God. I just, <laughs> something hurt my feelings today, and I'm just not sure if the God of the universe has it in control anymore. Sometimes we experience sad. I know someone here in the church had a cousin pass away this week. Where life sometimes is just sad. Like, yeah, God, I know you're in control. I know you're, you're working all these things, but I just, I just don't really feel like I'm into this right now. Maybe you feel some days where you feel like, I just don't want to read my Bible. Or some days you're like, I don't know if I can worship God. I just, my heart's not there. And he says, my soul is, I'm, my soul, I'm in. I'm all in. My soul's in. My mind's in. But my heart isn't. And he says, verse 42, chapter 42, verse 3 says, My tears have been my food day and night. So it says, yes, my soul, I want to be there. I want to have these awesome worship sessions. I want to have prayers. I want to see miracles. I want God work in my life. I want more of you, God. But at the same time, my heart's like, I don't know. It's so hard. Do you have that? I don't know if maybe it's just me, but that disconnect happens where sometimes in my life, I'm like, all right, Lord, I know I'm really frustrated, I'm angry, I'm getting bitter. I know I should trust you, but I don't really feel like trusting you right now. 
And it's hard. And David says, my tears have been my food day and night. I'm so in anguish, I can't even eat. And the tears are just coming down. So what do you do? What do you do when your head is there, but your heart isn't? What do you do when your head is there, but your heart isn't? And so the psalmist says, Why are you in despair, O my soul? He's questioning himself. David's literally in a fight with himself. He says, So why are you this way? You shouldn't be this way. Don't you know God's building this mansion for you? Don't you know that he's giving you hope? Why are you this way? Come on, soul, pick yourself up. It's the mind talking to the heart. It's like, come on, let's go. Let's get into missions. Let's get into evangelism. Let's get into discipleship. Let's get into worship. And the heart's like, oh, I don't know. I'm just feeling lazy. And I'm feeling tired. I'm angry. And his soul is like, come on. Why aren't you buying into this? Why have you become disturbed within me? Now, before we answer this question, which would be the obvious place in the sermon, but then the sermon would be way too short, and you'd feel like you kind of got cheated out when you only have a five-minute sermon, right? So we have to kind of, we're actually going to go to Jeremiah here. We're actually going to go through Jeremiah later in the year because it's actually quite profound. And if anybody was to ask this question, it was the prophet Jeremiah. If you look at little summaries of different books, like normally they'll have, you know, okay, this book is about this. They'll have like one word. If you look at the one word for Jeremiah, it's the depressed prophet. He's the discouraged prophet. He's a prophet that God said, I'm going to give you this message to go to Israel, and I want you to do it. I want you to obey and do that message, but they're not going to believe you. In fact, I don't, it's time that we judge them, so don't even pray for them anymore. We've, you've done enough, partic- enough uh, praying for them, and I've given enough for grace. Now it's time for us to put Israel in time out. So Jeremiah has got this message. He knows no one's going to like it. He knows he's going to be literally basically put in a well. His, his own countrymen are going to hate him. They're it's an unsuccessful, it's Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible Christian version. And so Jeremiah, he's like, this is depressing. God, I don't want to do this. His mind says, I need to do what God says or I'll be put in a, wh- a whale. I don't want to be like Jonah. So he goes and he gets really discouraged because no one believes him. Why are you in despair on my soul? And Jeremiah's like, I don't really want to do this, God. Can't we just go to heaven? So Jeremiah, God's talking through Jeremiah to his people, and he says, For my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, that's the first one, the fountain of living waters, to hew, that's a fancy word for dig, they, they left the fountain of living waters to dig for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. So God here's like, I've got this fountain that's just, just overflowing, it's just going everywhere. And that's where I want you to just experience that awesome, wonderful waterfall of grace. You know, there's all, pretty much every song. It's just this waterfall of grace. That's, that's what he's talking about. You're supposed to just this huge amount of water is gushing out more than you could possibly have, more than you could possibly need or want. And God's people, and sometimes I'm like, that's awesome, God, but I just, I don't, you know, well, that was yesterday and the day before, but I don't, maybe there's something more out there. Maybe there's something better. There's still some things I have once that you haven't met yet. And since you haven't met them yet, I'm thinking I'm going to go and, you know, we, we had a good time, God, but I, I, I'm going to try this. Maybe I should take control of my own because if you're not meeting my needs right now, God, maybe I should go dig my own well because I can definitely meet my needs with my well. So I'm, the first sin is just forsaking him. The second sin is I've replaced him with something that's much worse. And I'm like, I'm going to get my, I'm going to start digging. I'm going to build this well. And <laughs> it's not even a real well. Like it's cracked. It's broken. It doesn't even work. God's like, you can't even dig properly. I mean, what? And, and we left this geyser for, I was like, maybe I can meet my needs here, God. And we find we can't. In Jeremiah chapter 2, this is God's response when we do that. Thus says the Lord, what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? There's a lot here that I want to unpack here real quick. But do you sense the emotion that's there? Do you sense God's heart where he's just like, wait, what? You, what, did I do something wrong? What, did I not treat you with the love and the care that a dad does? I'm, I'm sorry, did, did I hurt your feelings somehow? Like he takes, we've hurt his feelings. 
He's like, I, I was trying to give you everything you ever wanted and everything that you needed. Was it, was it not enough? You say what you wanted and I'm there. But you left me. And it's really interesting. He uses the word injustice. It's like God saying, wait, you found sin in me and how I treated you? The irony, the irony, when it's really us who sinned against God, but it's the Israelites saying, you know what, God, I don't think you're doing right by me. I have certain things that you need to do in my life because I, I've earned it. I've worked hard enough. I've been a Christian long enough. I've served you long enough. How come you haven't done this? And so we left and we pursued, we came after this emptiness, and it says, they walked after the emptiness and became empty. So as we're digging, looking for this what's ultimately empty, we become empty in the process. You become what you pursue. God's like, if you want me, you've got to stay over here and pursue me. If you're going to pursue the emptiness, you're going to become empty in the process. And it's like, what? I, um, I, this, this resonates with me so much because I've been there. I, uh, I mean, I've been a Christian my whole life. I've gone to Bible college and seminary. And I, I, mean, I mean, when I was 16, 17, I was like, I want to be a pastor. This is, I, my, my mind has been in this camp. I'm like, well, God, let's set up shop. Let's go. But then there's times that come along that really make me wrestle with it. And one of those times was when I was 23, and I literally wasted a year of my life. And when, you know, when you live it like 80, 90 years, I guess if you waste one year, it's not that bad. But when you're 23, it seems like the end of the world, okay? Like you just graduate uni, you're single, you got all this energy, you got no kids, and you're like, God, let's take on the whole world. And God's like, no, I'm not going to do that right now, Kevin. And I had just visited Australia. I got the call to come out to a church in Brisbane, and I had to wait to get this visa. And I thought, okay, no worries. It'll take a month or two, then I'll come down and start working for, for God. You know, we're going to start saving the world and all that kind of stuff. Classic 23-year-old mindset. And God was like, well, Kevin, we're going to have to work on you because you're not ready yet. <laughs> you're still not ready. And, um, and so he just humbled me and basically was like, I'm not, that, that one month turned into two months, turned into three, six, nine, a whole year. And I couldn't do anything during that year because I, at any, as soon as that visa came in, the next day I was booking tickets to leave the country. I couldn't get a job. I, no one would hire me because I was like, well, I could be going to Australia at any moment. And they're like, whoa, no way. We're not going to invest into you. We're not going to train you. So I, I couldn't get a job. Um, I couldn't start anything. And I, it was, so I was just at home for a year. And it just tore my soul up. I mean, the first two weeks were great, you know, holiday. But after that, like, I'm, you know, our souls are made to be productive. We're made to do work for God's kingdom. I couldn't be involved in ministries. I, I even had a bad car accident. God took the car away. He's like, you're going to sit at home, Kevin. And I was like, God, look, I'm not going to doubt you. I'm going to stay in this camp. But my heart was like, I don't know. Maybe God's forgotten about how to do visas. Maybe God's not really in control anymore. You know, and my mind said, of course he's in control. But my heart's like, no, but maybe, this, maybe you need to step up. Maybe you're not doing enough work. And so I was like, all right, Lord, I know you're in control. And I was like, I'm going to go build my own well. I mean, I mean, I'm not mentally saying that, but I'm like, I'm going to go apply at some other churches in America. Maybe I'll get another job just in case this whole visa thing doesn't work out. Just in case God doesn't have it all under control. And so I applied at 72 different churches. And you know how many interviews I got? Zero. Lucky you guys, you got the guy who nobody wanted. <laughs> and God was like, no, Kevin. And I just, I became more and more empty. And God's like, why aren't you trusting me, Kevin? And it was hard, and I, and I had to learn this lesson. I finally had to come back to God and be like, look, God, okay, I'm angry, and I'm upset. And God's like, okay, it's about time you admitted that. And it's about time you come back here and just stay with me. Walk with me. And in fact, our whole, the, the, the songs we're singing, the communion, it's all this idea about waiting on the Lord. And we didn't actually chat. The communion and the worship team, normally we do, but we didn't this week. And it was just, wait on the Lord. For those who wait on the Lord will mount on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk, and they will not faint. When a heart feels like, God, I'm over this. I'm, gonna, I'm getting tired. And God's like, just wait. Just wait on me. Because those who don't wait, they miss out on Jeremiah chapter 3. And God says, then I said, how I would, this is God's vision. If we had waited, how I would have set you among my sons and give you a pleasant land, the most beautiful inheritance. And I said, you shall call me Father. Because like, if you just had waited just a, little, just a little bit longer, we were almost there. 
And you're like, no, God, I just, I need to have it now. And I'm giving up on you. God, so I go do my own will. He's like, God, oh, we just had this amazing land. Like, I was going to, I promised Abraham you'd be a, you were going to be a great nation. And through the whole world, you would be blessed. And you would bless those. But you gave up and you walked out. Are we willing to wait on the Lord? I, um, I, when I came to Australia my second time, I had to really test this. Let me, let me go to the next verse because otherwise it won't have any context and you're going to be like, what are you talking about? So Psalm 42 says, why are you in despair, O my soul? So what does the psalmist do? What do you do when your head is there but your heart isn't? Hope in God. Hope in God. Put your faith in God. Put your trust in God. Say, God, I'm here. I don't know what's going on, the wind and the crazy, but I'm pumping my tent here. We're going to camp here, God. No matter what happens, I'm here. My flesh is like, no, I don't want to do this. My mind says, yeah, it makes total sense to be with the all-powerful, all-loving God of the universe. And my heart says, I don't want to be here. You, my mind tells my heart, well, we're being here. So suck it up because we're going to stay with God. We're going to put our hope in God. And you know what that does to your soul? This is profound. What's the next part say? Oh, my God, my soul is in despair within me. You would think if you put your hope in God, that will fix everything. I'll be happy again. And the psalmist says, I'm going to put my hope in God, but my heart still is not wanting to be there. And that's the challenge. That's why it's so hard to wait on the Lord. Because just because you put your hope in God doesn't mean you're going to wake up the next morning and be like, all right, let's go. Jesus, ugh, I can't wait to evangelize the whole world. It might not happen. Our feelings won't change just because our mind says we're going to be trusting God. There's a second thing we have to do, though. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan. So he does two things. In the present suffering and the pain, he says, I'm going to put my hope in God in the future. I'm trusting the God of the future, and I'm also remembering the God of my past. And how God has worked in the past, so shall he work in my future. Sounds like a Bible verse. It's not a Bible verse. But that's how it works. He's the God of, of past, present, future. And how he's worked in my life in the past is an example of how he will work in my life in the future. Maybe not the exact same way, but if he has been loving and faithful in the past, he'll be loving and faithful in the future. He's already given his son. There's nothing more he could possibly give. Why would he not? And so I had a chance to learn my lesson coming back to Australia the second time. We got married. We had a kid. We were come down, working at a church in Brisbane. And before we even got here, it was hard. And, I'm, and I've, I've prayed a lot about this, and I've thought a lot about this, and I want to what I'm about to say, though, I say with a lot of respect to the church I was. I don't know if any of them are probably not going to listen to the sermon, but they are, I love that church. I mean, we, we gave our heart and soul in that church, and I know they love us. Our fridge is from them. One of our cars is from them. Like, it's just great. But just in the nature of when you're in relationships, there's miscommunication, and people get their feelings hurt, and things happen. And God, ultimately, God's the one at work. God wanted to test me again. Say, Kevin, all right, you, you've kind of, I'm going to see if you're going to go dig your own well again, Kevin. So we came, before we even came, the day before we were to get on the plane to come to Australia, we'd already booked our tickets. I got an email. We had planned on living in a house that the church owned. It was just across the street. It was a, it was a you know, a real nice house, um, several bedrooms. And we, we, you know, I had even, it was pretty silly, but I even had like a song that we were going to play as we walked into the house. It was like our first home. And I'm, you know, it was just going to be this, we're going to pray and this. Just, I was thinking, you know, man, I'm living this Christian. I'm just this perfect example of what it means to be a dad and a husband. You know, I'm fine. And God was like, all right, no. And I got this email that they had sold the house the day before we came to Australia. And so in my mind, we were basically homeless before we even moving all the way across the world. I mean, we had already packed. And I was like, and at that moment, you have to say, all right, Lord, I know you're in control. But my heart says, I don't feel like you're in your control because I don't have a house anymore. And God's like, well, what are you going to do? And that temptation is, well, I'm going to go find myself a house since you're not doing your job. You know what I mean? That's just how we do. That's how we, logically how we work. And the mind says, did God mean for this to happen? This didn't catch him off guard. He's not surprised. Kevin, camp here and wait on the Lord. And then, you know, then the question is, do we get on the plane? You know, when we, and we went. Lord, I'm not sure what's going on. I don't know where we're going to live. Come down. We came down here, and uh, we were, we, they uh, arranged for us to be in a small little unit in a retirement village. And it was better than being on the street, so praise the Lord. And uh, I, was just a, I was just way advanced in my, my life plan that I was in a retirement village at 25, so I'm doing well. Um, but then the first day of work started. 
And I saw my job description figuratively get just changed right in front of my eyes as the job I was coming down there for, one of the elders, who's not even there anymore, was saying, actually, I'm going to do that job, and you can do this, which I wasn't gifted in and I wasn't passionate about. And I was like, are you kidding me, Lord? I gave up everything. I moved all the way across the world, and you did this? And what do you do? And my flesh says, all right, well, forget this job. I'm going to go to another church. I don't need this. God, I, I've done, God I'm, I'm theologically trained to some degree. I don't have to put up with this. I can go find some other church. And God's like, really, Kevin? You're going to go dig your own well, and it's going to be a dried-up cistern. Like, you came and dig a well. There's no way you could do anything, Kevin, apart from me. And so Debbie and I, we got together, and we prayed. I mean, it was, it, I mean you know, it's just, it's tough. There's the times where you're like, Lord, I'm just not into God right now. You know, I get paid to be into God, and I'm not into God right now. I'm like, God, I don't know if you can do this anymore. And my heart said, okay, I'm going to control this situation. You know, maybe if I show them they've made a mistake, maybe if I blame, maybe if I do this. And I was like, God, I don't want to go down that bitter road anymore. And so we said, we got to, we prayed, and we said, Lord, we're going to stay here. We're going to stick it out. And it was three years we stuck it out for, and those were hard years. There was an office I shared with three ladies, and there was only one guy crying all the time in that office. <laughs> and it was me. <laughs> and they were great. I love those ladies. Um, but when you're just under, under attack by the enemy and by God, sometimes it feels, what are you going to do? And I didn't want to get to heaven and God say, Kevin, I was about to do something awesome there in you and around you, but you gave up. And I know if I didn't learn the lesson God wanted me to learn there, I would just go to the next church and experience the same problem. God's like, are you going to wait on me, Kevin? And I tell you what, when, I, when we wait and God brought us here, it's just been an incredible experience, and I thank you for that. Uh, we feel so loved and, and encouraged here, and we love you guys. And I just, and we don't deserve to be, I don't deserve to be here at all. I remember going home, telling my seven-month pregnant wife, we don't have a job anymore. What are we going to do? You know, and go dig our own well, or are we going to say, Lord, we're going to trust in you? And I found ourselves in an interview here at this Gimpy Church, and God was like, here you go, Kevin. And we've been blessed beyond measure. And I feel like we're in the pleasant land. I mean, I, I'm a huge fan of Gimpy. Sometimes Brisbane people give me a hard time. Oh, you're in Gimpy. You know, I'm like, you don't get it, man. You, you haven't seen the promised land. You don't know it exists. You're stuck in that big city. Oh, this is amazing. The people are great. The city's great. We just absolutely love it here. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. And so it says, this is Jeremiah. Going back to the chapter of Jeremiah, they do not say, where is the Lord who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness? So Israel, they did not remember God. When we had that hope in God and remember the past, and for me and Mark, we had to remember God has been faithful in our life before. He'll be faithful again, even when it doesn't feel like it. The Israelites, they forgot. You realize that God did those ten awesome plagues, you know, part of the Red Sea, like do you remember, the manna, the water, like you're literally walking around the desert, your shoes did not run, did not, um, yeah, wear out, whatever the, wear, it's a hard word. Wear out, you know, and God's like, do you remember that God did that? He's going to keep doing that if you wait on the Lord. And they didn't remember. Instead, they just complained. And so the psalmist says, this is how the psalm ends. This is how it ends. Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? His heart still is in anguish. It's still not easy. Why have you become disturbed in me? And he recaps, hope in God, for I shall yet praise him again. Do you see that? This is, this, I love this. Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. I don't feel like praising him right now. I may not be praising him right now. But I know if I put my hope in God, I will praise him again one day. I'm, in the future, wherever I'm at, I'm going to look back and say, thank you, Lord, for what you did in my life in that season. Thank you that it was hard. You did something. And it's going to mean something awesome up there. I will yet praise him. Do you believe that? I mean, it may not even be here. Maybe it's when you're in heaven. But we, I guarantee you, you're going to be praising him again. It's just a time. And, and sometimes when we look at that fountain, you're like, Lord, I don't really see this fountain anymore. It just feels really dried. I'm looking there. I don't see any water. God's like, just wait. Because when it's empty, our temptation is to go away. There's a, there's a famous geyser. I can't remember what it's called. It's in Washington. Does anyone remember what it's called? called where it's old faithful right yeah i was like it happens every time 
because it's faithful. Yeah, well, I've seen Old Faithful when I was a kid, and there's, there's times where it's not doing anything. It's still there. It's just, you know, re-energizing itself. I don't know all the science, sorry. And you're sitting there waiting, and then, like, every five minutes, just, <laughs> it comes up. And what happens is during those four minutes and 59 seconds, we're like, oh, I don't know if we drove all the way out here for, to look at a hole. It doesn't feel like God's there. But you wait. You stick your head over. <laughs> and God's going to blow. And it says, the help of my countenance, literally, he's going to put a smile back on my face. My soul is distressed. But my countenance, my face, is God's going to help me. And my God. Not just in God, but he's my God. What Jeremiah said, that they will, call, they will one day call me Father. And we say, Daddy, I want to put my hope in you. I want to put my trust in you. Help me not to follow my heart. Help me not to go dig my own well for those who wait on the Lord. What do you do when your head is there but your heart isn't? You hope in God. You remember the God of your past. You wait on the Lord, and you will yet praise him again. Let's pray. Dear Lord, sometimes our lives are, don't feel like praising you. And they can be tough. They can be challenging. But Lord, we know that you promise to never leave us nor forsake us, even when it feels like you have. Even in this psalm, David says, Lord, have you forsaken me? And Lord, we just want to confess our honest feelings. Lord, this is how we feel sometimes. And we need your help. I can't just will myself to follow you all the time. I need your grace, Lord, to guide us. And Lord, I pray for people here who are experiencing challenging times, Lord, that you will give them the courage to, to just put their hope and trust in you. For those who are in a season of grace, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that you are the, the, the fountain of living water, Lord, that we might appreciate this because it won't always be like that. I pray for us in the future, Lord, when we're, when we're 10 years older, 20 years older, that you will give our future selves the courage to be able to stand by you, to put our hope and trust in you, Lord, that you might be the countenance of us, that we will yet praise you again, Lord. I pray all these things in the powerful, wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We'll just stand up and we will praise him right now.
Father, you are king over the flood, and I will be still and know you are God.
you do move mountains, Lord, and that we can find our peace in you, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you become the worship anthem of our lives and our soul's desire, Lord. I pray that you will keep us wanting to come back to that fountain over and over again, Lord. I pray that you go with us this week, Lord, that we just keep you the center of our lives. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that enables all that to happen. And through his name we pray. Amen. I thank you for coming today. We, we pray that you have a blessed week. Also, uh, downstairs we have a morning tea. Please come down, especially if you're new. We'd love to...